What we've been seeing this evening as Brother Jonathan has just spoken to us is the demonstration of the superiority of God over Satan. Uh, despite the efforts of Satan to overthrow the purpose of God, God has not been hindered in bringing to pass all that he purposes concerning humanity. Uh, we, we see this manifested in, in, in Jesus and in Adam. Uh, more specifically, we're seeing, as Brother Jonathan said, that single act of Adam which brought sin into the world is not as influential as an event as the one act of Christ which put sin away and brought in everlasting righteousness. Now that sin with all of its varied effects and all of its corruption is not a force more powerful than the grace of Almighty God. As we continue on our text this evening to conclude the chapter, the Apostle tells us more specifically of this contrast and testifies to the abounding nature of the salvation of God. This is verses 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, despite what some men may think about the law, our text this evening is testifying that it was not given ultimately as a means of righteousness or a means to be justified in the sight of God. Uh, the, the law in this capacity revealed more fully what, what, um, what resulted from the disobedience of Adam, the corruption which was caused by the fall. The truth that is in this text, uh, Paul opens up more specifically in the seventh chapter of Hebrews, and it's, it's kind of like a commentary of the reaction of flesh to the law. And this is verse number 7. For if that... Um, yes, I'm in the wrong, wrong book here. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law has said, Thou shalt not covet. So, firstly, we see that the commandments of the law more clearly define what sin is, that they make that distinction. Furthermore, in the individual reception of the law, uh, it causes men to see a clear contrast between themselves and God, and it causes them to realize that they are, in fact, sinners. The law was given to this intent that mankind might re realize the deplorable nature of their condition. However, it did so indirectly. Uh, the law didn't just come out and say, you can't do everything that God needs you to do per perfectly. It didn't, say, it didn't say it in that way. Uh, men couldn't even, couldn't even receive it if it had been that way. Um, our condition was so low that uh, we wouldn't have even believed it if he had just come out and told it to us. We had to be able to learn this experientially. God set forth a requirement, and he says, I, I, you need to do these things perfectly. To follow all of these commandments, you have to do it. And then the working out of it, they learned by experience that they weren't able to do it. And it, ha it had to be this way. Uh, Paul continues in the chapter, he says, But sin taking occasion by the commandment, it wrought in me all matter of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found it to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment, it deceived me and it slew me. So secondly, in addition to the awareness of sin within them, the receiving the commandment actually causes sin to flourish within the man. It stirs it up. It gives it power. The realization of wickedness actually incites more wickedness. All this being said, we got to be careful about the way we say this, and Paul does this as well. The law itself was ordained unto life. It wasn't ordained unto death. It wasn't anything uh, doing to any kind of imperfection in the law that this happened. This was the, the reaction of sin against, against the law of God. He talks about this also in Hebrews 8. Um, he says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place should have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith. He also says later, I, I, um, I regarded them not, saith the Lord, because they broke my commandment. So that's, the law itself didn't cause them to sin, but the reception of the law identified the evil within them. And, and being able to see this, it actually made manifest the secrets of their heart. It, it made them realize exactly how much evil was in them. And this actually caused it to, to, to come to the surface, to overflow. 
Now, we continue to see this, this contrast in this between the nature of God and a man. That the, the more the holiness of God is held before mankind, the more of the goodness that the Lord reveals of himself, the, the worse and the worse flesh actually gets. Uh, God, uh, um, we see this in the children of Israel in the wilderness, that uh, God demonstrated abundantly the power which he had towards them and, and uh, delivering them from the Egyptians and spoiling them even as they went out and t- delivering them through the sea. And they got into the wilderness and what did they say? Did God bring us out here to kill us? You know, that they couldn't have even reasoned on all the things that God had did for them, all the, 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 this power that he had brought them out with. And as soon as they got out into the wilderness, their flesh just... He he brought us out here to die? They couldn't even have faith that the same God that opened the Red Sea for them couldn't give them provision in the wilderness? And it it, it just kept testifying of this, even as as time went on. Even at the the foot of Mount Sinai, you know, I read Brother Gibbons' commentary this last week, and he he had said something I never really thought about before, is that uh, the children of Israel really weren't noted uh, to be an evil people when they were Egypt. When they were in Egypt, we don't read anything in the scriptures about them being known for fornication or idolatry or any of these other things. But at the foot of Mount Sinai, just when the, the, uh, the tiniest bit of God's requirement was, was uh, set before them, they couldn't even wait for Moses to come down from the mount. They had, they, they had already made themselves a god and were dancing before it. I mean, just this over, overflow of evil, just that at the, the, the slightest amount of God's person being revealed to them. Uh, this ought to be proof enough to anyone who has a penchant for legalism that you can't train flesh to be holy. You, 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 can't make it, you can't make it do it. The more and more you try to make flesh do what's holy and do what's right before God, the more and more it resists and it bites back from it. And, and you know, this, isn't, this actually isn't what God is doing in salvation anyways. He's not, he's not saving Adam. He's not reforming the Adamic nature to be, to be holy before him. He's saving us from it. Now, all these things which came as a result of the law being given, all the, the, the reaction that men had to it, these, these, this wasn't a surprise to the Lord. You know? It wasn't like the Lord failed in his attempt because this, this wasn't even given. Uh, like, like Brother Aaron said earlier today, it wasn't redemptive in nature. It had a purpose, and it, it worked well for the purpose that it had, but it wasn't, it wasn't for that. Unless there was this divine standard set forward and men uh, tried themselves to, to do it, they would have never come to this conclusion by themselves, that they needed a Savior. And that's the reason why it was theirs, because that they had to come to the conclusion and realize, I can't do this, I need help from God. So then, the apostle continues in our text, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Uh, the, right off the bat, this shouldn't be surprising to us. If this is surprising to you, then, then there's a problem, you know. Why wouldn't what God has done be more effective than what Satan has done, you know? It, God created us. He is our creator. So how, how could his work in us not be more abundant than the work that Satan had done in us? And what glory would this bring to God if he only restored that which was damaged and he didn't actually make it better? That's what we're talking about in salvation here. Now, uh, I, I thought about this when I was reading in 1 John this past week. Uh, we can see this in the capacity of our Lord to forgive us our sins as well, where he says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he not only forgives you of that sin, but he cleanses you of the unrighteousness in you that caused it. He not only removes the guilt associated with it, but he, he, he cleanses the, the source of it. And I, th- I thought this too, that Jesus was manifest to destroy the works of the devil. And this also applies on an individual basis. And in destroying the works of the devil in you, he didn't just leave you at a baseline there. And then now he's got good works for you to do. He had got good works that were foreordained from the foundation of the world to do. These works of the devil were cast down in you, and now you, you've been given something to do in the kingdom. And also, whenever these, these strongholds that Satan has made in our minds are cast down, we're not just left at a baseline there either. New, holy strongholds of thought are built up in our mind. The quickening power of the Spirit is far superior to the doling power of sin, and that's, that's just a fact. 
And, and, and redemption, we're not, I've said this before, but I think it's a good point. We're not being restored to the innocence of Adam when he was in the garden. We're being created in righteousness and in true holiness. This isn't just based on innocence. It's an experiential righteousness. Um, In redemption, like I said, he hasn't cleaned our human nature, but he's given us to be a partaker of the divine nature. It's, it's It's a higher order of things. He saved us from the guilt and the power of our sin, but we also have a power working within us by which God is able to do exceeding abundantly all that we can ask or think in Christ Jesus. It is true, brethren, that we have been raised to greater heights than to depths that we had ever fallen. Now, we can see this also in the example of the apostle himself. That experience that he had on the road there, uh, from, from that point on in his life, He didn't just not persecute the church for the rest of his life. He actually gave his life to strengthen the church. He gave his life to preach the gospel. He did not, for the rest of his life, leave alone the people who were of this way. He actually became one of them himself. And we we, we can see this in in Peter, too. I was thinking about this, that Peter didn't just live the rest of his life without ever denying Christ again. But he lived the rest of his life that he would make sure that he let everybody know that he was with Jesus, that he was one of those who was Christ's followers. He gave the rest of his life to propagate the gospel. Now, I don't, although I don't think that people would just come out and say this, I think that by inference, the majority of a um, professing Christians in our day, by the way they live their lives, are basically saying sin abounds more than grace. Uh, That's just in the manner of their conversation. I I mean, granted, in the flesh, he is invincible, you know. We don't want to minimize the power that Satan has to uh, um, overcome men. But I think that the power of Satan to successfully get men to give in to temptation has been like put up on a pedestal in our day to the the damage of of, uh, realizing the power of God that he... The, the power of grace is much more powerful than the power of sin. Amen. We must not live our lives just by barely getting by, you know. We, we, we shouldn't fall into the deception that it's so hard to merely stop ourselves from being overcome to the superfluity of naughtiness, you know. I, I thought of the wor- words of the hymn writer as I was going through this, that grace, grace, God's grace... Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater. It's greater than all of our sin. Now the church is the ultimate demonstration of the superior nature of grace over sin. On that day, when Christ presents the church unto himself, holy and blameless, without spot or wrinkle, it will be evident to the entire assembled universe that God overcame the devil in every capacity. That uh, sin's effects upon these people, these holy, holy people, that they have been completely and gloriously removed from them in every way possible. That Satan, uh, um, any kind of damage that Satan uh, did it w- w- will have been completely overcome. And not only that, but they have been brought up to unimaginable heights. So lastly, here, here he says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. Now, almost every other version other than the King James has this text reading that as sin hath reigned in death, accenting the manner of the reign of sin in contrast to the reign of grace. But I personally think that the King James Version kind of gets the point that the Apostle's making in this verse better. Uh, He's already made this point earlier in the chapter. Actually, he's referred to the reign as the reign of death all the way up until here. So he's already made that point. In this verse, he's, he's, he's making the point, he's contrasting the end of these two things. That sin, the reign of sin, the end of it is death. And the reign of grace, the end of that is eternal life. Now, uh, firstly, um, I, I want to go ahead and look at it both ways, though. As the other versions put it, that sin has reigned in death. That is to say, it rules in an environment of death. That's the environment in which sin, sin rules. And uh, um, as I said, this is the way in which Paul's referred to it in this whole chapter. Uh, he spoke about death reigning. And these are two words which are inexorably tied to one another, sin and death. As things that we, we can't think about them separately. 
Wherever people are spiritually dead, that is to say, wherever they're dull, wherever they're without ears to hear, wherever they're blind, without a capacity to respond to the things of God, death or sin has been reigning there. Now, in death, there is a separation. And in the garden on that day, in that one act of disobedience that Brother Jonathan told us about here, uh, when that was done, they did, in fact, surely die, as God said that they would. Uh, this, this was immediately evident, and, and um, this separation was immediately evident, even to Adam and Eve. They may not have known all the particulars of it, but they hid themselves, and they created something to cover themselves. Uh, this environment of death, it's, it, it already began to establish itself, even at, right, after the, right after the act. As the, as the generations proceeded, we, we were able to see more and more and more. It was more apparent what happened in that, that one time. But even at the very beginning of it, it was, it was fairly evident. Uh, second, the, the reign of sin has resulted in death in every man that has ever lived. It's for this reason that it's appointed for every man to die. It's because of sin. Now, it's a complicated issue when you look at it in detail. That it's, it's true that we have sinned because we were born in a state of spiritual death. But it's also true that sin, when it came into the world, brought with it the curse of death. Now, the initial entrance of the sin into the world is what caused the eventual physical separation from the world to be brought into existence. Um, our separation from God and being cursed with this sinful ma- nature, it's every person has to die. That's, I mean, the curse that was pronounced on the earth, there's no getting away from that. But uh, there's coming a day where it will no longer be in existence. Well, we can see uh, just in this how, how what, what uh, Jesus did is superior to what Adam did in that, is that uh, Satan in the reign of death, that's not going to last forever. There is going to become a day when death will be swallowed up in victory. There is going to become a day where, where it's, it's going to be no more. And this, this death won't even ultimately triumph over those who, who are in Christ. This death isn't even a triumph over to those who are in Christ. They just, they just pass through this death. Then on to this reign of grace. Now, in the religious environment which exists all around us in the present, I don't believe that I've ever actually heard anybody talk about grace in this manner before, that it, it reigns. It's most often used as a substitution for mercy, is how most people use it when they define it, God's unmerited favor or undeserved favor. And actually, in some of the modern translations, they have replaced every single place where it says grace, they put God's unmerited favor. Even if it doesn't even make any sense grammatically in the sentence. I mean, it's almost ridiculous just to see it. I mean, I, this, this is a, a, you've done, they've done a great disservice to the people of God in doing this. Uh, uh, grace, as, as I see it, is uh, it's aggressive. It, uh, grace cannot simply be described as favor. It's divine power which is granted for the intent and the purpose of causing the individual who receives it to be empowered to do whatever it is that God requires them to do. That's grace. It has a dominion. It has a sphere of influence in which when it executes its intention, it, it, it does it without frustration. It, the, there is a sense in which there's an environment in which it's effective in accomplishing everything that it intends to. There, there is no ultimate frustration of the grace of God. Now this reign is one that is executed, as he says, in an environment of righteousness. Sin is an environment of death. This is an environment of righteousness, which is it's, it's a connection to God, a separation from God. It's a holy reign. Now, those who've been imputed the very righteousness of God, they have subjected themselves to this reign. As, as we are aware of our acceptance before God, grace reigns in our hearts and in our minds. It reigns in our life. It does the work that it's intended to do. It, it more fully conforms us to the image of His Son as, as we give ourselves over to this reign. Now, this, its ultimate purpose is to create a people who are a perfect mirror of the Son of God. Now, in this, we can also see, the, again, the ultimate superiority of grace. The results of it will be eternal in all those who it works in. It won't be overcome. It, its intention will be brought to its fruition. The purpose for which the grace was given will be fully realized in its complete intention. However, this isn't the case with sin. It's the effects of sin in the race of man have already been diminished. 
And the putting away of sin, the power which Satan used to have to bring in accusation before God, that he doesn't even have that power anymore because he doesn't have a foundation for an accusation. A God is just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus Christ. God is the one that justifieth. Who is, it that, who is he that condemneth? Nobody has, has a, a, a grounds for this now. The problem of sin which prevented righteousness and peace to kiss one another, it's gone now. It's, it's been removed in aggregate from the face of God. Also, we can look at it on an individual level. The separation between God and man that Satan achieved in the introduction of sin into the race, it's, it's been removed from those who are in Christ Jesus. So you, even that portion of, of his supposed victory has been, has been squashed. All this, and in, in this entire chapter, as we've gone through this in the past few months, we've been able to see more clearly the two most prominent men in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Adam, the firstborn of the natural creation, and Christ, the Son of God, the last Adam, the firstborn of the new creation. The things which they did, they were the most influential and epochal events of in the entire human history. Um, all these things can kind of be expressed in summary in this, this one verse. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So then this evening, the question is, which one of these men are you associated with? Because God, as far as God is concerned, there's only two categories. You're either of Adam or you're of Christ. And on that, on that day, it won't, it's not going to go favorably for those who are of Adam. Let's just, let's just put it that way. So I don't know about you, but in considering these things this evening, I, I've come to the conclusion that I share the desire of the Apostle Paul as he expressed himself in Philippians 3.9. I just want to read this in closing. I, I, it is my desire that I may be found of him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being, being made conformable unto his death, but if by any means I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. I, I trust that you share that with me this evening, brother. Amen.